Well, welcome everybody to our second ever multidisciplinary panel event at the Games Institute and th today's theme is cooperative games. So before we get started about the purpose of the panel and a little bit about the Games Institute, I'm just going to start off with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the land traditionally used by the Ottawandran, Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldimand Tract, which is the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies of the Indigenous peoples with whom we share this land today. So thank you for coming. I'm Marisa Benjamin and I work here at the Games Institute as the Research Communications Coordinator. So I wear a few hats around here, but today my hat is to be the moderator for today's panel. Um, so what that means is I'm going to be tossing our panelists a few questions here and there and we'll work in some critical analysis and then we'll take questions from the audience afterwards. So let's um, actually, I should just say, um, the space you're sitting in is the Games Institute. We are a multidisciplinary research center focusing on games and interactive related, re interactive technologies related research. And we have about 40 to 50 graduate students who work here and then a larger network of researchers outside of it. And it's awesome to see when multidisciplinary researchers come together and collaborate. And today we're gonna showcase that type of thinking. The purpose of this panel is um, to bring Lindsay Meaning, Rena Webby, and Marcella Bonfim together to talk about cooperative games. And I've tasked them with playing Overcooked 2 as well as Spirit Island. Overcooked 2 is a video game, Spirit Island is a board game. And this just gives them some common ground to talk about cooperative games as a genre more generally speaking. So Lindsay, would you like to introduce yourself? So tell them about your program, what you study, what games you play, and how you got into researching games. Okay, you might have to remind me of the last question. We'll see if I forget any. Uh, hi, so my name is Lindsay. I am a second year PhD student in the English Language and Literature Department. Um, my research focuses on um, single player games mostly. I study a lot of RPGs. I'm looking at um, the way that narrative, visual and textual rhetoric and mechanics work together to generate meaning, uh, specifically from a post-colonial perspective. Um, I also study game adaptations of literature, um, looking at the way narratives and themes shift when the mechanics of the games are, are implemented on them. Um, in my spare time, I play a variety of games. I have a strong affection for the Assassin's Creed series, so that's a lot of my gaming time. Um, I also play the other big AAA ones, mostly RPGs. I'm terrible at FPS games. Um, I got into game studies um, quite recently, actually. I played games as a kid and then stopped playing for many years. Um, I only got back into games about six six or seven years ago. Um, I wanted to go to Italy, but I didn't have the money, so I thought playing Assassin's Creed 2 would be a great way to walk around Venice. Uh, and then I discovered that like, stabbing people is really fun. Um, and it just sort of uh, cannonballed since, since there, and I actually got really into looking at games from a critical perspective. Um, so, is that all the... Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. and before you... So we'll just note that RPG stands for role playing games and first person and FPS stands for first person shooting games. So hi everyone, I'm Rena Webby. I'm in my fourth year computer science PhD and my research is mainly about large displays, um, but I also am cross affiliated with the Games Institute because I look at playful interactions on these large displays specifically as a test bed for understanding how people collaborate, how people share spaces and how people share resources. So this panel is right up my alley. Um, overall, I got into game studies kind of by accident. I was uh, studying psychology in my undergraduate and then I was looking for a graduate position, but I found that all of the things I listed off about psychology related more to a contribution to computer science. And then I ended up finding a supervisor in computer science and um, that was partially motivated by the fact that I was doing brain computer interfaces in my masters and um, I was working with an 
as an intern at a company that also did brain computer interfaces. So I just happened upon it and there we go. And then I liked computer science enough to stay and do my PhD and this is how I kind of got here. Um, although I like a variety of games, if you ask me to name which game I like, I'm not, I'm just gonna freeze. So right now I'm currently playing Fallout 4 and uh, play a lot of D&D, &D. Dungeons and Dragons. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Marcella. I'm a third year PhD student in the School of Public Health and Health Systems. And um, I have a background in nutrition and in human computer interaction, in like both two degrees. And then at some point I was looking for doing a PhD that I could put together my both areas of interest. So um, I got into games by chance um, uh, as well as Rina. Like I was researching a way that I could um, apply technology to health, and then I went here at the University of Waterloo to look at the program I watched for um, the School of Public Health, and then that's how I found my current supervisor, Dr. Jim Wallace, and, um, and then I found out that he was part of the Games Institute, and which for me was very interesting, like I love games, so why not um, apply games for health and exploring the area of nutrition? And so my research focusing on exploring game food design for uh, increasing people's food literacy. And, um, and about the games that I play, um, recently I basically only play cooperative games. And um, we have uh, at home an Xbox One and a um, Wii U. And um, basically all the games that we see around there are cooperative, we try and we play. Um, I really enjoy the Gears of War series. Um, Shrine, Diablo, um, Diablo 3, uh, as well as, um, let's see, many examples, others. Um, we are recently playing, oh yeah, Resident Evil 5, 6, now we're playing Revelations 2, and uh, recently playing Arrival 2 as well, it's very cute, and we sometimes try to play uh, Cuphead, which is hard as hell, but we try. Uh, yeah, so we just try a variety of um, cooperative games, and that's um, what I basically play nowadays. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, so as you might have gathered, each one of these panelists has a very different skill set from one another, and the intersection is in games and in cooperation and thinking about how humans relate to these types of technologies and experiences. So they, I chose, well, we chose together um, who should be sitting on this panel and what games we should be playing. And you'll notice that there's very different inputs that they'll take. So Marcella, for example, will put in a lot of input on Overcook 2 in terms of food literacy. Lindsay will speak about Spirit Island in terms of post-colonialism. And Rena will talk about the collaboration elements and the cooperation of these games. Before we dive into Spirit Island, I just want to see a show of hands of who in the audience had a chance to play this game or look it up. Oh great, I was actually thinking that we might have had nobody, so that's great to see. Um, how about Overcooked 2? Okay, yes. Yes, this makes a lot of sense. So Spirit Island is a, is a board game and Overcooked 2 is on the Switch. And Overcooked 2 is very, very popular and has a lot of notoriety around the way that people cooperate in that game. Um, and who is a fan just generally of cooperative gaming? And while we're having you raise your hands, what about competitive gaming? And lastly, what about solo gaming? OK, cool. Basically, we're fans of games. So let's discuss Spirit Island. I'm going to give you an introduction to the game, but you have to know that it took us each over an hour at separate times to learn the rules of this game. It's very, very complicated. And it's very fun and rewarding once you learn, but you do have to get over that hurdle. I'm not going to be able to explain the rules to you in this 30-second preamble. So essentially, the game is a subversive narrative of colonial games like Settlers of Catan or Forbidden Island where you come in and you develop on territories. Instead, in Spirit Island, you are playing as the spirits who govern, or sorry, not govern, who um, protect the land from invaders. And you are working, um, or you're working together as representing different spirits of the land. And you also have um, Dahan, who are the um, indigenous peoples of the land that you try to protect, and they similarly try to protect with you as invaders come. So the win conditions of the game have to do with whether or not you can successfully protect the land, and the losing conditions are if the invaders come and develop too much. 
So the invaders will come in, they'll explore the land, then they'll build, and then they'll ravage. At the same time, you have to put your presence on different areas on the land, and then you have to protect it, and you have to fight against the um, invaders using natural forces. So each player represents a different spirit, and each player has a different, or each spirit has different um, skills that they can employ. But in order to win, you really do need to cooperate because there's a different distribution of skills. And some people are much better at the defense, and some people are much better at the offense. And you, I, I, in my experience, would not be able to win by myself. So panelists, what is your experience with Spirit Island, and what were your impressions of the game? Oh, big question. Um, I really enjoyed the game. Uh, I love complex games that take forever to figure out. Um, but I approached the game playing it as um, sort of a response to Settlers of Catan specifically. So uh, in my playthroughs, I was really uh, comparing the two and um, how they were different. So from my perspective, I really enjoyed that it was pushing against the exploitative colonial narrative of, you know, let's get economic success at any cost and let's um, make invisible the people who are already on the land. Um, I found, oddly enough, that the fact that you play as spirits of the land rather than the actual native people was a really interesting choice to me um, because it almost made the game more of a, an environmentalist narrative than an actual um, anti-colonialist narrative. I mean, colonialism is uh, condemned in the game, but it's because of its effects on the land. Mm -hmm. um, it's viewed as, um, so what happens is the land gets blighted by the uh, colonialists in the game and the blight cascades um, and destroys presence itself, but also if there's too much blight, you, you lose the game. Um, so for me, the, the, the Dahan, the natives in the game are called Dahan, the native uh, inhabitants of the island, um, are sort of made secondary to the land itself, which I thought was an approach, was uh, interesting. Um, other experiences, I don't want to take up too much time here. <laughs> Um, I was also, I found very interesting the fact that the manual had a large section that was just world building and lore. So it laid out um, in the back of the manual the entire history of the island. Um, and it framed, it framed the Dahan as immigrants as well. It spoke about how when the Dahan immigrated, at first they caused blight, but they came to an accord with the spirits and had their agriculture adapted. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, the Dahan were framed as successful settlers, whereas the colonialists were non-successful, and it really came down to sustainable land use, I suppose, was uh, the message of the game for me. Um, but so I found some of the sidelining of the Dahan a little um, concerning in points, but... I can talk more about that later. Yeah, we'll get to more. Those are my basic first impressions. Well, um, my case, I don't have this deep uh, explanation from the narrative story. Like, I mean, uh, I played some, um, I didn't play too much of the game. I'm, started, I'm still a beginner, beginner in this uh, game. It's a very hard game. And um, uh, as opposed to Lindsay, I, hate big manuals and having to waste too much time trying to figure out I love that someone explains to me. <laughs> and I uh, had Nicole to explain to me and took a lot of time to explain it. Like, uh, what I feel about this game is that you start playing is very, very hard. And I think that with time, you get to know it as you play more and more. But uh, I like the idea of um, the game, the mechanics, uh, having the different uh, characters that are asymmetric and complement each other. So you have different um, abilities um, and weaknesses and strengths and then you have to work together collaboratively to try to think about um, a strategy and uh, it's a lot of decision making as well to make. We can be a little bit overwhelming if you are a beginner but it's, um, it's nice that it is a cooperative game so you can be with someone close to you and ask, oh, uh, ask for some opinion, oh, what do you think about those cars? What should I do? And this is a good thing about this game being uh, cooperative so you don't have to figure out by yourself, like, what should I do? And oh my God, I have no idea what I should do as a strategy. So I like this approach of um, having to rely on each other. So we have to progress together and uh, think about a better decision that will be good for everyone. So that's the thing that I, I like that. 
So I would say my experience is a lot closer to Marcella's than it is to Lindsay's. Um, I generally prefer games that are easy to learn, hard to master, because that way you can get into it and you can start playing right away. And I found that the first task we had to accomplish as a cooperative team was getting through this manual. <laughs> So uh, that actually was kind of an interesting task in and of itself because, you know, when you first start to play a game, luckily you have one veteran who will tell you the rules, but also you must explore the manual as well yourself. So I wanted to jump right into it, but the game doesn't allow for that. But what the game does allow for is this idea that people play together and are present and concentrating on one stimulus that they have in common. So it gives a really good chance to form relationships in the game, like and around the game and be like, uh, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. And I thought that was quite a nice collaborative um, effort. And also the asymmetry in the game does make it necessary to collaborate so that one player can't carry the team or win on their own. So that was quite an asset to this game because you're forced to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that you hit on the learning the rules being the first cooperative challenge. Um, and we ended up having Nicole, shout out to Nicole, um, she works here at the Games, the Games Institute. We ended up having her come back and reteach the rules. I had to learn them three or four times before I really got the hang of it. So that's a huge part of this game. And later on when we talk about Overcooked, there's going to be a contrast because Overcooked, they throw you into it and you learn as you go. Um, but with this one, you really do need to dedicate some time to learning. Yeah, so I want to thank you for your patience with that. So I want to uh, talk about the mechanics and what um, cooperation looked like in relation to the mechanics. Um, and I'll also throw out some questions too about what you thought of the different elements inside the game. So the fact that fear is something you need to build in order to overcome um, the invaders, there's all these, all these interesting mechanics that are baked into the game. Um, that change the way that you have to cooperate and they change your relationship to the game. So yeah, comment on user experience and mechanics. Rena, would you like to take this first? So again, I thought this was a really interesting shared user experience because every player has to rely on the other to come up with the different parts that are lacking in their own character. But as an individual, it can also be really frustrating because you want to be able to push forward and play the game. And the game forces you to stop, hold back, and collaborate with other people. Um, another really interesting part about the game is you have slow movements and fast movements. So slow movements, you start at the top of the round before the settlers have their turn. And fast movements come after the settlers had a chance to explore um, and ultimately ravage the land so because your cards are more effective if you play them faster right so you get to protect some of the land you get to circumcise some of the blight on the land you actually want your as cards to be sped up but only one player may have this ability if any player has it at all because it might be the fact that nobody has chosen this character that can speed up slow movement and that mechanism makes it so that characters really do rely on each other as well because you might feel like okay well I only have one fast movement it's not very effective and in order to play the game successfully other people need to also have some fast movements so that your slow movements don't seem like such a waste or like too behind for it to really help um, and without that uh, there would be like a real uh, sort of I guess imbalance in the way the game progresses because otherwise it would be really hard to win without your other friends and other characters so even though your individual experience might be somewhat compromised the group experience is better overall because of it sure um, in terms of mechanics, I was just thinking about what we were talking about before, the different experiences. And I'm, I'm thinking about why I don't play cooperative games very often, because I, I don't. And um, the reason that maybe I focus much more on the themes and um, messages of the game, it's because I am a player who loves mastering the material and then bossing everyone around. Um, <laughs> I'm very very like AC can probably attest we played together um, how bossy I am about cooperative games and that's not very good for building relationships so I spent I read through the manual like five times before we even started playing and um, I just wanted to comment on that, that I think individual personalities um, 
really impact the way you experience cooperative games mm -hmm. um, for me. Anyway, and, uh, in terms of specific mechanics of the game, I really um, love the way they framed different spirits and the way that who you're playing as affects the way you see um, the colonizers in the game and the the native people the Dahan so example um, there's one spirit called bringer of um, dreams and nightmares yeah. it's a spirit that's entirely focused on on generating fear um, every any damage you do would that would kill a settler is is instead converted into fear points um, so you can um, that's entirely different than say uh, another spirit that I played as that I really enjoyed. Uh, it was called Thunder Speaker, and the focus of this spirit was actually protecting and acting through the Dahan, the indigenous people of the island. And when the Dahan were killed, your presence as a spirit is also killed. So suddenly, playing as the spirit, there was an actual negative impact for the Dahan dying. Whereas in the normal game, they're you know casualties of war. Sometimes spirits even kill them as side effects. Um, so switching spirits made me experience um, the relationships between the native people in the land and the colonizers um, much more differently, and in a way that sort of made the experience better for me in terms of um, it being a response and it being an anti-colonialist um, narrative. Hmm. If that. Okay, so are there any final comments on Spirit Island? Because I think we can switch over now to Overcooked and then we'll integrate um, Spirit Island and Overcooked in the latter portion of this. Yeah, any final remarks about Spirit Island? <laughs> okay. It's, well, it's right up my alley. We'll make sure to throw something back to you again. Okay. So maybe turn off one of those. Yeah, I will turn off. If I turn off this one, can you still hear me? Okay. Good. <clears throat> okay. So, Overcooked Two. Um, with Overcooked Two. The premise of the game is that you are on a team in a food truck that drives around this, maybe let's call it a city, with different stages and at each level you are preparing different food, trying to get orders out to serve people. And you have to work together as a team to delegate tasks because you have time limits in which you have to prepare all of these orders and then serve them. So you have to collect money and gain tips and if you fail orders you lose money and then by the end of each round, you need to hit certain targets in order to advance. A lot simpler than Spirit Island. But when you're actually playing the game, the cooperation looks very different. And I would argue possibly more complicated. Let's start off with impressions again about Overcooked 2. So I actually really liked the game Overcooked 2. I didn't play it before I played it with um, Lindsay, actually. And uh, Lindsay will have a very interesting comment on it, I think, about how different personalities relate to gameplay. So I'm not going to take that from her. Um, but I really just wanted to kind of talk about how the mechanics work. The, the controls were rather simple. Uh, and instead of having something like Spirit Island, where your interactions were almost pre-planned by the game designers, the game designers pre-planned for chaos and emergent behavior so they wanted the players to have to fight over how to best strategize and win this game and this was really great because not only is it a contrast in how you learn the game it's a contrast in how you play the game and it's a contrast on what behavior is expected from players so uh, automatically jumping into the game was really fun for me um, and what I mean by that is I came up to a group of people already playing already practiced and said can I just take a controller <laughs> and uh, don't tell me oh just tell me what buttons do and that's it and uh, I wanted to play it that way as my first experience because I've feel like that kind of randomness and chaos is what makes the game fun and for me it was very enjoyable however <laughs> so I was in this uh, group and I was already struggling emotionally um, I don't do well with with time limits and uh, urgent situations I want to be able to survey and plan and then execute so diving into overcooked at all was difficult for me because they don't let you map out the level before you start playing you just have to start playing um so i was already quite frustrated and then rena jumped in i feel so bad for her having to play this game with me because i 
I just, uh, I almost gave myself a rage aneurysm. I had to walk away. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. Um, yeah, so that was, sorry, Rena. I mean, for me, it was only more fun. Yes, chaos, let's do this. I'm uh, good at disturbing things, I guess. <laughs> no, I was there too, and I loved playing with those guys here, like, Oh my god, just watching like both planes and it's fun to see the different like I was playing too, but like at the same time just watching it. And it's fun to see like that different people will just want to start differently. Like Lin uh, Linton came and then, well, stop everything. I have to understand everything that I have to do before I play. And then it's okay, let's see, let, let's, that's the recipe. That's how we do. Okay, now we can start. And then after uh, Rina just came, yeah, yeah, just give me the controller, let's go. And, uh, and that's funny to, to see it. And uh, yeah, and well, and about my experience playing Overcooked, uh, like, I feel like I'm addicted to Overcooked. I love it. I played uh, one, two, all the DLCs. I'm always waiting for more. I just just love it. And um, yeah, and I play with my husband. We have the worst fights ever. And I think a lot of people here will relate with that. Like, I mean, it's a cooperative game, but yeah. Um, but I mean, like, we fight with each other and then um, we, at some point after we lose many times, say, okay, now let's plan, let's decide what we have to do, let's um, divide our tasks, um, define what everything, what everyone will be doing, and then we go try again many times. Like, we always want to try to get the three stars and make Kevin happy, because in the end, we just want to make Kevin happy <laughs> with the three stars. And uh, yeah, and that's it. I, like, I mean, uh, I love this game, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to. Um I wanted to, to riff on that. So after I played the game with uh, Rina and Marcella and uh, Marisa, I went home and I purchased it because I can't stand being bad at something, so I had to practice. Um, and I, I asked my fiancé to play with me, assuming that I would end up murdering him. Um, but actually, it was... <laughs> It was the best teamwork I've ever experienced. We were completely calm the whole time. We were getting three stars right off the bat. Uh, so I don't know if that's a commentary on like the strength of relationships maybe. If you're used to working as a team, then you do better. I should also say that my fiance does work in kitchens. I've worked in kitchens as well, um, but he has for many, many years been a cook. Um, and he, so I trusted him to delegate the tasks to me so whereas I perhaps don't let anyone else tell me what to do, I acknowledge him as an authority. <laughs> um, so, and he actually, uh, he remarked that the simulation of being in a kitchen environment and overcooked was actually very accurate in terms of the stress and the emotion and the communication. So it was abstracted, obviously, um, to the, the symbolic and the... Um, you know, it wasn't quite an accurate simulation in that sense, but in the emotions it evoked, it, it was very, very accurate, according to him. And I, I felt the same level of stress playing it the first time as I, as I had previously working in kitchens. So I'm going to go with that. I don't know if that's... Actually, something I wanted to mention that uh, Marcella actually told us when we were playing the game is that if you hate the game, you should tweet the developers because they love it. <laughs> and I thought, that's great, right? Like, And I really think it's quite interesting when developers interface with their community in that way. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been a few conferences that I've seen that developers take feedback from their um, sort of online gaming community and try and keep that relationship stronger to keep the game stronger. But um, it's quite interesting to hear about developers who have an appreciation more for the negative feedback than the positive feedback, which, you know, in my mind, as somebody who stu studies user experience, I'm just like, well, what? But then it kind of makes sense because the point of their game is to inspire this chaos and this disagreement and the fact that they have done so and they've created these negative feelings that make you sort of drive to play the game more out of rage or purchase the game just because you're bad at it um, is actually great for their business model. And I thought that was interesting. And I mean, um, and I mean, like when when we are like are hating each other and fighting, like in the end, when we win, then we get so happy and we just like, yeah, we could made it, and like, just all the bad bad things turns out to be a good thing in the end because we just accomplished it together. It was a cooperative game. If it wasn't for each other, we couldn't have uh, achieved that. So, 
that's uh, a good thing in the end. And yeah, and for overcooked overcooked too, they removed the the ice, which was very helpful because ice was. <laughs> I agree about the higher rewards. I found um, when I was playing with my fiance and we were actually good at the game, it got boring pretty quickly because we were just succeeding at putting food out. And, you know, it's slightly less fun, although also so uh, give and take. I don't know so which experience which I preferred more. I, I might. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So while you're talking, so many other questions have just been floating around my mind. Um, so time limits and delegating tasks and all these other things. But 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 I have to ask about story first and then we'll you know, we'll reintegrate all of that because I was thinking about this and I was talking about this with several of our GI members. Um, overcooked, too, is basically just pressing buttons picking things up and push it, putting them around. Imagine if you don't have the context of it being a kitchen, how boring that game might be. Um, so it seems as if there's no real story going on in Overcooked, but there's a massive emphasis on story when you, when you really think about it. And then the more that you play the game, you start to notice that these thematic elements carry through and they put a lot of thought into their story. So if you want to uh, comment on story and narrative development, and then Marcella, this is a great time for you to talk about food literacy. Yeah, please do. Do you want to start with someone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, for Overcooked it's true, the narrative is that the unbreds are invading, like, the Onion Kingdom, and then you just have to defeat them and protect the Onion King and Kevin, of course. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and that's, that's the story. I mean, like, I don't know if there is any more profound than that but we can create our own story with food literacy like if we like I mean um, if I get overcooked and related to my research for example I found I find that it's just a common game but my area I try to explore game food design and games that can be used for serious purpose so why not try to explore overcooked and try to figure out if people actually try to go to the kitchen after they um, play overcooked or if they try different things or um, or if they learn some new recipe like for example I have I, I'm pretty sure that my husband had no idea that he could make pancakes with eggs and flour, for example, and he definitely learned that with overcooked. But I mean there are so many different recipes so I wonder if um, people would um, try to do, do those recipes and try to to try new foods based on that and that could be something to be explored as a serious games why not right to try to see if people would um, learn some cooking skills with that or even like change their eating patterns by playing the game so So I jumped into Overcooked without actually listening to anything about the Onion King or knowing who Kevin was. Um, just found out now. There's a Kevin. Anyway. <laughs> but you know what? There is very much functionality in how they set their mechanisms in an environment that was already familiar to us. And I think that was pretty interesting. So instead of having this huge narrative that you needed in order to be grounded and interested in the game, they had immediately kind of given you sort of like a free ride on the idea that everyone kind of knows what goes on in the kitchen. Kind of, right? I'm sure not all of us have professional restaurant experience or are professional chefs, but we can imagine that there's many components and there's somebody who has to wash dishes and there's somebody who has to plate things. And already we have this kind of like entry information that allows the mechanisms to be embedded in a story that we already understand or like a cognitive schema that we already have in our brain if we want to think about it from a psychological perspective. So I thought that it was quite interesting how they created um, a game based on almost simplicity in story and simplicity in mecha mechanism and really their function was to create this emergent behavior and to use almost like player emotions as the motivating drive for continuing the game forward. It's interesting what you said about cognitive schema that we already have, um, because from a narrative perspective, what I was most interested in in Overcooked was the choice of recipes and the environments that you find yourself in while cooking them. Because um, for me, food is such an important part of culture. Um, and I think that we have a lot 
of our understanding of culture tied to food. Um, I read, uh, so I don't know where to approach this point. So one of the things I noticed, um, so you cook burritos sometimes in um, overcooked, but the only place that you ever cooked burritos is in the mines, the mine levels, and you appear to be feeding the burritos to um, miners, like people with little hard hats on. So um, sort of the connection of traditional, I guess, Mexican food to menial labor. Um, it's, I'm not making up the connection, it existed. I checked, the only place that you serve burritos in the game is in the mine levels. Yeah, um, and it, actually, I don't know if I can tell this story. It's not really analysis. It's just interesting. Um, so the game developers in the UK. So there might be some sort of cultural association with um, burritos, handheld food in in mines. Um, but actually, there is a, a state in Mexico, Hidalgo, I believe, um, where a great number of Cornish uh, miners from Cornwall in the UK migrated in the 19th century and they brought the Cornish pasty with them as a sort of handheld food that's really good for um, workers in mines to eat because you can just throw away the thick crust after. Um, and the people living in Hidalgo sort of adopted the pasty as a local staple and uh, it's still a staple today. They had the only uh, pasty festival in the world up until a couple years ago when Cornwall decided to copy them and do their own pasty festival. Um, so it's this idea, I don't know, it's, I don't have a point with this. It's just a really interesting story that actually in a state in Mexico, a food from the UK is a cultural staple. Whereas in the UK, the developer is just saying, well, let's do burritos and tie them to this mining labor. It was just a very interesting thing. And I'm not sure if it was deliberate at all, but it's the kind of thing where the choice of food has meaning and the place in which you're serving it has meaning and the um, sort of collection of recipes that are chosen, I yeah. think have some cultural meaning. Um, for example, why so much sushi when the other food is pizza, burgers, fried stuff? Um, why do they have chicken and French fries, but not fish and chips when it's a developer in the UK and they already have fish? So those are the sort of questions I was asking myself uh, in terms of, of narrative. I just wanted to point out that that's really one of the interesting things about this panel is that I thought of, oh, how people engage with each other, how the game promotes engagement, how the games take away engagement. But did I think about burritos? No, I barely knew what the ingredients were. <laughs> so thank you. Now I have an interesting perspective, although slightly troubling, on uh, the food in the game. <laughs> No, I was just going to ask um, to add that actually uh, they really explore many different cultures and they have a DLC which is a celebration of the uh, Chinese New Year. So they have a lot of many different uh, Chinese dishes and are very interesting to, to get to know them. And yeah, hopefully they have more DLC with uh, food around the world that will be perfect. Here, developers, if you're watching this, you know, eat food would be great given the current Resident. environment. <laughs> yeah, I wanted more Thai food in the game personally, but. Rena, you stole my words, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, also, side note, DLC stands for downloadable content. I'm not sure if we gave out that definition. But yeah, no, this is exactly why we do the panel because you have all of these ideas coming out. So something like a question about narrative or story in Overcooked might seem like, oh, how are we, how, what is the story here? But, but really, um, these things, these ideas of cognitive schema paired with what's happening in the kitchen, it really speaks to a lot. And you can do a lot of observational analysis from there because I argue, and I'm sure Lindsay would echo this statement that it's worth it to kind of interrogate these connections and these underlying cognitive schema that make decisions like putting pizza or sushi or sushi as level one, for example, um, as you know, it's relevant and there is an underlying meaning there, even if the developers didn't intend it. Okay, I let's broaden this up a bit now and think about Overcooked 2 in comparison with Spirit Island, in comparison with the genre of cooperative games as a whole. You mentioned time limits, and that plays a huge factor. The very materiality of these two games also plays a huge factor. Overcooked 2 is a video game, which means that all of the players work 
work um, together at the same time, and the game can actually control that and make sure all of the ga the players have to do their tasks at the same time. In contrast, Spirit Island, it says that we have to work simultaneously. We have to do our tasks all at once, but how it plays out is actually we take turns helping and guiding each other, and it moves a lot slower. So um, what does it mean for cooperation when there's things like time limits and delegation of tasks? Um, do you want to start? Basically just repetition. <laughs> just the first time is just to understand what's happening many times. Like the good thing about uh, video games in general is that you can like um, fail and try again and try again, try again. That's different from board game, for example, that it's terrible when you just draw a card that you shouldn't have been drawn that will carry you forever <laughs> until the end of the game. A bad decision will just carry forever, which is different from video games that are just like, do it again. So at least for me, I don't um, care much about timing. I just like, I know that the first time I'm just going to understand what's happening and just try and do whatever and then figure out what exactly I have to optimize and how the, the, the level will change because sometimes things will change um, places and so, so um, the phase will, will change and uh, adapt. So, and then we'll try again and, and, and then we can have plan before and strategize and combine what, what you're going to be doing and then try again and that's it. Yeah. Until, until uh, in the end, you hopefully will get the three stars. So I think time is actually a really interesting mechanism that game developers can play with because the less time you give people for the amount of decisions they have to make, the more pressure you're putting on them. And therefore, the more pressure you're putting on the collaborations that are possibly tenuous in the beginning. So in a game like um, Spirit Island, where you have enough time to sit and help everybody think through their moves and everyone takes their pace, this is a lot better for you know building relationships uh, around the game, trust, content like that um and that kind of emotional like i'll have your back don't worry if you don't understand the pacing is slower and it's controlled by the player group it inspires a very different form of collaboration than something like overcooked which is a lot of decisions and very little time and putting a lot of strain on player relationships to kind of have the sort of like um out of the frying pan into the fire approach to creating these uh, relationships between players like you'll might click right away like uh, Lindsay was saying that she clicked with her fiance they formed a team right away or you might not and then that might give you something to laugh about later for example with me and Lindsay now we have a great story about that one time we tried playing overcooked together and both of these form and simulate different types of relationships between players but that mechanism of time really changes the type of relationships the players have yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think that games like Spirit Island, um, where you can take your time, build relationships, and then Overcook tests them, <laughs> um, puts them in the fire, quite literally. Um, and again, I know I'm reiterating this, but so much depends on the individual personality of the players, um, which kind of games they prefer and which kind of teamwork they excel at. So I know that my own personality does not excel under high pressure situations in terms of dealing with teamwork. That's why I work individually most of the time. Um, sorry, you weren't going to comment. So I actually thought that Lindsay, before the panel, was talking a little bit about how guilt plays a role in uh, the collaboration in Overcooked, because she was saying that she felt guilty when she wasn't a good collaborator. And I think that's actually really interesting. And I did a study on uh, whether or not people believe they're collaborating with a human or a um, an AI non-player character, um, so artificially intelligent non-player characters controlled by the game system. And uh, what I did in this game is we used some deception. So we had um, told some people, like a third of people, that they were playing with a human when they really were playing with an AI, or playing with an AI when they really were playing with a human. And in their qualitative feedback, their responses about guilt were actually really profound. With uh, some player, for example, had said, uh, in during gameplay, I would save you, but you're a bot. It turns out she was playing with a human, and uh, that guilt played a big role in how she responded to her qualitative interview. And that's a really interesting part because guilt can almost be—it's even though it's emergent, it can almost be like a 
a mechanism for game developers when they're designing for this disagreement between players? That's interesting because I always feel guilty playing collaborative games of any kind. If it's Spirit Island that I'm actually good at, I feel guilty for being bossy and overbearing and taking away the winning the winning move from someone else. If it's D&D, which I play with both Rena and Marisa in separate games, I feel guilty for taking up too much time or um, bringing my own ideas too much into the fore. Um, and I don't know, this isn't really related, but I don't know. I'd be interested to see a group of men playing Spirit Island and how much guilt any of them felt and the way any behavior behaviors might come out differently than say a group of women. I don't know. I just feel like guilt is something that maybe is socialized into some people more than others, or it's just me having a complex. I, I don't know, but well, according to psychology, it's not just you. <laughs> oh, good. Good to know. Okay. So I have to admit that I am a competitive gamer. Um, in, even in cooperative games, I struggle not to be competitive because even if we're all trying to win, I want to be the best winner. Mm -hmm. And I become competitive with my teammates, which doesn't always work. Because for me, I find that competitive games give me like a sense of self-efficacy. I feel as if I've achieved something and proven my own worth when I beat my friends or my family, even if it's my little sister. So why would people play cooperative games compared to competitive games? What social experience does it give you? And we've already kind of touched on this, but I think that there's a lot more here in terms of learning and uh, relationship building that cooperative games can give you, where co competitive games would probably actually damage in some cases. Um, so why, why play uh, cooperative games as why opposed to competitive? Um, I don't know if this answers the question, but I found that in when cooperative games when you're designing them it, it turns out that the player group is taking a more reactive position a defensive position as opposed to single player games where you are the one acting against other people right so um i don't know that experience of reacting together of defending something might be more meaningful than like acting on the world you know so say you're playing ticket to ride against each other you're building railways um you know is that emotionally is that as emotionally rewarding thematically as defending your home against an outside invader so i don't know i think maybe the mechanisms impact the narratives in a way that i i have no foundation for this it's just my experience with these two games like um i don't know i'd have to look more into it so I actually did do a paper on co-presence, so like having somebody there while you're playing a game um, versus just playing a game by yourself or playing a game with another person. And that game's ability to give you guys something to focus on that is outside of each other is actually a really interesting effect on the player experience because instead of focusing on trying to continue a conversation or doing this type of social work, you have sort of a conversation starter or an icebreaker in front of you. And I thought that was a really interesting approach to collaboration. And there's a lot of papers out there in um, HCI and computer science and psychology that talk about how the spectators change the game or how um, it changes the game when you're playing DDR at home versus you're playing DDR in an arcade. So I think it's actually a really interesting question about what does the other person do for me, even if they're not playing. But if they are playing, we know that cooperative and competitive games have very different reactions on relationships. And a lot of my studies look at how people react in the collaborative environment and how people react in a competitive environment. And a lot of times the rules of social engagement change and it's not always in the way we would ex expect. For example, um, a game where you might have to invade each other's territories. Invading territory, I found in my study, is actually more acceptable in a collaborative condition where you're being helpful versus a competitive condition where you're now taking that person's points. So even just small things are redefined by the relationship or the social circumstances that we put each other in. Yeah, like um, I'm more into cooperative games than competitive games competitive games is like just from my um, personality. I really think that when you're playing cooperative game, I think it's more rewarding in the end that you just like were there um, um, working with someone and getting a plan, a strategy and trying to do something together. So it's more rewarding in the end. That's uh, how I feel. I really um, enjoy more playing a 
cooperative cooperative games and especially when you just meet someone and to create a friendship i think it's um, easier if you are playing a cooperative game than a competitive game that you just might have someone that you just met just hate you <laughs> or something like this and um and 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 it's fun a uh, fun thing about like board games when i play uh competitive board games uh i hate it because mainly if i i'm i'm with around people that i don't know very well and there are some points that sometimes i have to draw a card that you just have to attack someone and i'm like oh my god i don't know well these people i'm just gonna attack them and i just attack my husband always <laughs> because he will understand in the end and if he doesn't it just like we'll resolve this after but uh yeah that's the thing i just feel like i don't want to be the villain or be mean to someone like to choose someone uh, mainly if i have to choose someone to attack but that's uh the thing that's about my experience so yeah i i, I think it's more rewarding and cooperative in my personal experience, I have friends that will only play cooperative games. And in my research, I find that a lot of people don't want to be the villain. So I think there's a little bit of a connection there that Marcella has made really clear. Because a lot of times in competitive games, we are taking aggressive approaches towards each other, which in some ways can be really fun, but in some ways can be really stressful. I find that I like competitive games because I can be the villain sometimes that I can't be in real life. So if I'm playing a competitive game and I'm acting like a controlling jerk, that is sort of more in real life than attacking someone in the game, which is a, a more acceptable way to uh, get out some aggression. Like, oh, I blocked your train route. That's just the game, you know? So it's kind of the, the circle where I am allowed to be um, uh, nastier than I would be allowed to be in real life versus just sort of on the edge where maybe... I don't know. And I think there's like a lot of work here that we can relate to in both psychology and computer science because um, that idea of I get to do things that are outside of the scope that I would do in real life or I have this magic circle that's protecting me or it's just a game. I can do it because it's just a game. And in a way that type of um, belief like, oh, it's just a game allows us sometimes to display characteristics of our personality that we wouldn't otherwise show or what's not socially acceptable and I think that's really an interesting part of playing games uh, and playing games with other people is you kind of get to know them and when terrible but like kind of a good example of this is Cards Against Humanity because what people laugh at and that game if I would argue is really about knowing who you're choosing cards for than choosing cards. Okay, so I think it's time to open up the floor to any audience questions if you have them. You've been sitting here for a while. There's a lot to digest, but throw anything up when you think of it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, I'm going to come over and hand you the mic. Uh, Rena, I, I, I think it was you earlier. Uh, you mentioned you played a lot of Dungeons & Dragons. I was, this will depend on the panel's like familiarity with it, but Dungeons and Dragons is kind of interesting because it's got a competitive element and a cooperative element that sometimes the players are competing against the dungeon master, sometimes they're all working together. Uh, how does this, does it draw on both aspects of this, the cooperative and the competitive? Does it, what does it, or does it do different things than the games we've been talking about thus far? I think this is actually a really interesting example because lots of games, and we didn't really touch on this very much in this panel, uh, work on both having cooperative and competitive elements. And this allows for interesting dynamics within the game, but ultimately makes the game a little bit more complicated and for some more interesting. And I think Dungeons & Dragons, the really great thing about it is that it provides so much freedom to players because it's all in the mind of the players and the dm and dm being the dungeon master and sometimes you're right we are working against the dungeon master and whether it be like um explicitly against like we're fighting a monster or it be just um too much banter or changing the story or refusing to complete the main mission and those are two types of elements that provide cooperation between players but again uh, there is still the competition between the dungeon master and the group and these social dynamics are kind of similar to um, 
well, not completely similar, but if you think of a really simplistic example in video game version, it's like the three versus one in like Mario Party, right? Like, so you have collaboration between some of the players and competition between others. And it can also be really interesting to think about how those dynamics change the way we play the game. And it could also be how we divide the teams. What strategies does each team get? Are the teams balanced or are they symmetrical? And um, like, for example, in, in Code Red, Code Blue, that game where you have um, pretty much different clues on the table and two different teams that are equally uh, given an opportunity to solve for the game. Uh, in that place, that's going to be very different than a three versus one game or D&D. I was trying to think if I had something to add because, like I said, I play I play D and D with with Rena, and I what you said just then about being against the DM, I forget sometimes that the DM is actually a person <laughs> <laughs> who is actually playing and not just you know uh, an embodiment of the game somehow. Um, so <laughs> going off track and having too much banter, I always always forget how frustrating that must be to the person who's actually trying to tell to guide us through a story. Um, and now I have another thing to feel guilty for, so it's great. <laughs> Actually, I think a really interesting example is Werewolf. And I remember my first time playing Werewolf, I played with somebody who was narrating the game so well that I thought it was like he was working at the cafe. <laughs> and I don't think I'll ever forget that game experience because it really kind of shows how much people can really invest in games and how they can create systems and worlds for other people in which to collaborate and play in. And that sort of facilitation or that facilitator role that is present in D&D and, and again in this game Werewolf where the person chose to be the facilitator, that's actually a really interesting perspective on the game because you're almost making yourself um, the entity in which inspires the game, but also which creates conflict. And conflict often comes from competition or collaboration together against one uh, like ferocious monster or uh, invasion of werewolves. So, and I think that's a really interesting thing to study to see how facilitators approach gameplay. No? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a Dungeons and Dragons or role playing games panel at some point because there's so much to talk about. Because I would have added, when I play D&D, especially with Lindsay, our characters compete against one another. Constantly. And we try and manipulate one another. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. She killed the love of my life. And I'm one of the yes, same. my, char my really character really killed bad. her romantic interest. Anyway, um, is there another question from the audience? Back there? Sorry, I arrived, I arrived late, so I'm not sure if you've covered this, so stop me if, sorry, stop me if you've already covered this. Um, so in uh, the game that you guys are studying, Spirit Island, um, a lot of community around that game tends to uh, allowed it for solving the quote unquote quarterbacking problem, um, where one player will kind of, in a cooperative game, where one player will kind of like control what everyone's doing. Um, and I think the way they went about that was increasing the complexity of the board state so much that one person couldn't really read it all at once and have the game progress in like a timely fashion. Um, but it tends to like turn off some players who might not want to play a very like complex game. So in your research or in your own personal experience, have you found any kind of other methods of creating cooperative games that sort of suppress the quarterbacking problem or? I mean, it's um, in my research, I, I haven't focused much on this, but in my personal experience, I found that I, I do tend to be the one who's trying to control everyone in a cooperative game. And I think I liked Spirit Island so much because I actually couldn't. Like, I could give a lot of advice and we could work together, but it was actually impossible for me to control every aspect of the board. I had to let go, and it was kind of freeing. Um, I also couldn't control everything in Overcooked, but it wasn't as freeing there, possibly because of that, that ticking clock. But uh, in my personal experience, it worked really well, and I, I enjoyed that mechanic as the quarterback. Like, I appreciated what they were doing with that. I think it helped. 
I think that it would be really interesting here to kind of think of the work on personality and gamer types, because uh, a lot of this work, um, actually, like shout out to Gustavo Tondello, who um, is working primarily on his thesis on game types, is talking about how we have different people that have these different characteristics and how they shine through in games. And um, it's really interesting that we think of the quarterback as a problem because sometimes, yeah, they steal the limelight, but sometimes it's nice to have somebody who emerges with natural leadership. And I think that having this game where you kind of got rid of that problem is interesting for people with other personality types that may be like less overtly aggressive, but do want to have more of a leadership role. So I think that this would be a really interesting game to study with personality type questionnaires like the Brain Hacks, uh, which is a questionnaire that looks at emergent players and how player types and characteristics are sorted into different categories. And I mean, even if you think of uh, like Overcooked, right? Like, as I was saying, I'm very much um, happy to disturb, right? Like happy to just jump in and not know the story and not know the controls and don't tell me where the recipes are, I'll figure it out, right? And um, partially that's because I'm a bit of a destroyer <laughs> and that's just fun for me. And although it might not be my primary personality type according to that questionnaire, it is a part of my personality that only comes out at some points. And it's not like the only concrete, like of course they're subject to change and um, you know, like mood, uh, different factors of the day, different games, different relationships. There's so many things that change the way that we might react to a game. So this is just one way of looking at it. But it is really interesting to think about that kind of personality, personality characteristic. Okay, I think we have time for, let's take maybe one more audience question. If there are any audience questions here. Yeah. Pardon? I have a semi-goofy one. Yes, please. Um, this is for you, Lindsay, okay. and for you and your partner who have chefing experience in real life. The chaos and frustration of the simulated overcooked kitchen, is that something that your partner can disassociate or is it like I do this for work why would I come back and enjoy this frustration here that's not a silly question that's a good question he he in the game he actually enjoyed playing it uh, so he liked he enjoyed having that experience in his spare time um, but I think part of it is he's been pushing to find a cooperative game that we could play for some time um, so I think having something that we can play together got over his aversion to recreating kitchen experiences at home. Um, I should note that this aversion does apply to washing dishes and, and cooking dinner quite frequently. Uh, the sort of, I do this all day, I don't really want to do it at home. Um, but I guess it applies less so to games, to give a slightly goofier answer. But um, no, I think, I think he did enjoy it. Um, I think it was different enough in the details. It was sort of a more cartoony version of the kitchen. and. Um, I think it was different enough. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We only really played it for one session, so we might peter out, but I'm hopeful. I'd be kind of curious to know if he liked it because it gave him a chance to share his experiences at work with you. Mm. That's possible. I mean, I have, <laughs> let's say, when I get stressed, I start dreaming that I'm back in a kitchen or back waitressing again. So it's sort of my, my stressful place. So uh, I don't think that I would choose to return to Overcooked, but I think he enjoys the kitchen environment a lot more than I did. So he, he does sort of thrive under that stress and that fast paced environment, whereas I, I don't. Um, so I think that might be why he enjoys playing it more in his free time than I do. Just personality types, again, differing. Um, I don't know if anyone else here has experience in restaurants. Oh, yeah. Maybe, Marcel, you can uh, kind of add in here what it's like to have food in games because your research revolves around um, food literacy and gamification. And to me, those things don't necessarily seem connected all the time because food and grocery shopping doesn't seem fun and yet your research makes it fun and you developed a game that made it fun. So how does that uh, play out? Yeah, so based on um, my research, so yeah, my research uh, explores game food design, so it's not necessarily uh, a game. So it's um, I use um, 
game mechanics and um, game um, elements in systems that are not games to help achieve specific tasks. So in my case, for my first study, I designed and developed a mobile app that people take to the grocery store and then as they um, scan and add products to their car, they learn from the food and they have, um, like, there is a narrative that they have a pirate boat, which is their physical cart, so they have to add products in a way that you keep a cart uh, balanced in a way to prevent it from sinking into the ocean. So that's uh, basically like the narrative. And then you have um, your nutritionist that comes to you, which is my dog, Bridget. <laughs> and uh, she guides you during um, your shopping. And then uh, that's the idea. So I got um, game elements, this narrative, this idea, and apply it to a system that people actually are doing uh, grocery shopping. And um, the thing about Overcooked is that it could help to develop um, food literacy if there is some adaptations, or you could even like explore the game itself to see if people would, uh, like I mentioned before, would develop some cooking skills by just playing the game as it is, or could just develop something that could input, let's say, you could add some nutritional information or add some more um, complex recipes where people have to learn something and then try to see if they can apply this in their real lives. And uh, yeah, so that's the thing to get something fun and try to extract from it so people could uh, actually do that in their real lives. Thank you. And that's an excellent segue to our final question before we close out today's panel. Where, or if you were to use either of the games that we've discussed today, Spirit Island and Overcooked 2, in the next research project that you do or paper that you write, um, how would you focus on these games? Uh, what would your methodology look like? And what do you think the value in studying these games would be for your research? Big question. Um, I think I addressed some of it. I actually have Spirit Island on the B list for my upcoming primary comprehensive exams um, because it does fit very well with the research I'm doing in terms of um, analyzing um, its visual rhetoric and uh, the narrative and the way that you engage with the game from um, a post-colonial perspective. Um, so I guess I would I would look, take an in-depth look at the way the game presents the story, about the way the mechanics treat um, the indigenous people, the Dahan, um, about the way colonization itself is represented. Uh, I would probably, I want to actually look closely at um, the economics of colonization. Um, specifically, a research question that I had was, in Settlers of Catan, you get resources. Um, from the land. I mean, that's what the land is for. That's base, the basic, at its at its core, that's what colonization is for, getting um, resources for the economic benefit of the, the metropolis. Um, so I wanted to look at why there is no explicit economic aspect in Spirit Island. Um, and I found, just thinking about it, that the ravage phase um, in Spirit Island, you don't see the motivation behind ravaging. It's just the invaders are there, they're damaging the land. But um, I sort of see it as the getting resources frayed from settlers, um, just from the opposite perspective. So you don't see the economic resources uh, leaving, you just see sort of the land destroying. So that was, that's sort of one research avenue I would take. Um, I don't. For me, I'd be more interested in understanding the different types of collaboration between the two games. So if I were to approach these games as a study, I would look at a within subject study. So that means uh, participants would try both games. And then I would like to know how the collaboration differed from their perspective, like qualitatively, I'd ask them, but also quantitatively, like how many helpful moves did they make? How many aggressive moves did they make? How many statements of like anxiety or aggression did they make out loud or how did they react with the players? Yeah, mine would be like similar to what I mentioned before, like having an empirical study that could uh, put people to play the game and then assess after if they learned something new, if they learned some recipe, develop their food literacy based on cooking skills. And um, 
yeah, and then maybe compare different recipes and see uh, which one they preferred and run a qualitative study as well to see what they would like to have in a game like this, what they would like to learn, what recipes they would like uh, to be able to do. And yeah, and um, one thing that would be interesting is that if Overcooked used like VR, maybe it would be interesting. So you get people to actually do something. I think that would be awesome if like developers again, like if you want to do a... VR version of Overcooked, that would be awesome. Much more realistic. I get so sick. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining us, panelists. Um, if you can please give them a round of applause. Thank you for attending our second multidisciplinary panel. Um, please follow along for events and updates. We're actually having a second multidisciplinary panel um, next week, but it's with two faculty members. So if you can make it out to that, that's going to be a lot of fun. It's on Spider-Man. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. And please help yourself to the yeah, treats at the back. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks.